Good morning. All right. Welcome to GitHub Satellite. We are so happy to be here with you today in beautiful Berlin, and we have quite a show for you today. Welcome to the 800 people who are able to be in the room with us today and to the thousands more who are watching online. This is a really exciting time for us to be at GitHub. More people are joining GitHub every day than ever before. And so the audience here today represents the more than 36 million developers who call GitHub home. Now, today we have a lot of great blockchain announcements. I'm just kidding, there's no blockchain announcements. <laughs> Uh, we have a lot of great announcements to show you in three different areas, security, enterprise, and community. We're going to show you the work that we've been doing to make software development more secure from end to end, to help better support and serve large organizations and enterprises, and to serve open source maintainers and contributors. But before we get into all of that, let's take a step back and talk about what's really at the heart of GitHub which is the open source community. Every day, developers around the world make millions of contributions to open source projects on GitHub. And we thought it would be interesting and fun to take our data set of that contribution stream and actually visualize it on a globe. And that's what this is. Every little ray of light that you see coming out of the Earth and going into space represents one contribution to an open source project from someone somewhere on Earth. And I just, I think it's so cool. This is real data. It's over 100 million contributions over 30 days being visualized here. And one of the things that immediately stands out for you when you look at this is how global our community is, right? More than 80% of the contributions that occur to open source come from outside the US. So in a way, if your company or your team is using open source code, you've already embraced remote work. Now, the chances are you have already started to use open source code because nearly every software project on Earth today has open source dependencies. So whether you're working at a large company or a startup, whether you're a scientist or a student, you rely every day on open source code and you rely on the people who create it, right? Every line of code that you write builds on the work of thousands of others. And you can think about it this way. When you import an open source library into your code, you're not just adding code to your project. You are effectively adding a team of developers to your extended team. You're actually almost giving them commit access to your code that you then put in production. But then you also get to benefit from the work they're doing every day to improve their packages. So this is the reality of building on open source. And if anyone wants to make an editor extension that does this, I think that would be really cool. Um, but, but still in our heads, we have this stereotype of the solitary developer. Right? When we think about the act of writing code, we often think about a developer alone in a dark room. Right? It's just them and the computer writing code. And you sort of you slip pizza under the door, and it gets converted into code and uploaded to the cloud. That's still a mental image that we have when we think about developers. But in reality, software development is deeply collaborative, right? We're all a part of an interconnected community of developers. And this morning, I'm going to tell you a story about how thousands of open source contributors work together to help create a major scientific breakthrough. This is the first ever picture of a black hole. It was published just last month, and more than 4.5 billion people around the world have seen this image. It's very famous. And it is a huge landmark achievement, right? Scientists have theorized about black holes for decades, but this is the first time we've ever actually seen one. And this one is at the center of a galaxy called M87, which is really far away. It's 55 million light years away from us here in Berlin today. And the scientists who created this picture used a global network of telescopes to generate a huge amount of data, which they then composed into this image. They spent years processing that data to get this image. And this is the moment of truth, right? This is Dr. Katie Bauman, one of the lead developers and scientists on the project, and one of my personal heroes. And this has become an iconic photo of this landmark human achievement. 
I personally, I love this photo because as developers, we can all identify with this feeling, right? It's like, it's that moment when your code finally just works, you know, when all your tests pass, when all your hard work kind of comes together. It's a, you look at it and you, you feel that same feeling yourself. And, and it also makes you wonder, too, to look at this picture, right? Like, what did it take to get to this point? What was involved? What were the math and the science and the algorithms that were involved in, in getting here? And then, like, what's going on on that chalkboard in the background? There's a triangle there. I have so many questions <laughs> when I look at this. And so here to answer those questions, please welcome, via satellite from Boston, Massachusetts, Dr. Katie Bauman. Katie? Hi, Nat. And hello to all the satellite attendees. Thanks for having me. Katie, we are honored and thrilled to have you join us today. You're in Boston right now, and it's nearly 4 in the morning there. <laughs> yeah, I really wish I could have been there in person. Uh, well, you're a busy person, Katie, so thanks for taking the time to join us in the middle of the night. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about what it took to produce this image of a black hole? Yeah, of course. So taking the first image of a black hole was a huge endeavor and took many people years of hard work in order to build the computational telescope that made it possible to see the unseeable. Because the black hole we looked at is so far away from us, it's 55 million light years away, it appears incredibly small in the sky. So it's about the same size to us as a grain of sand would appear in Los Angeles when standing in New York. And because it is so small, we needed to build an Earth-sized telescope in order to resolve the ring of light. But since we couldn't build a single dish telescope the size of the Earth, our collaboration instead spent over a decade connecting telescopes from around the world using the precise timing of atomic clocks. And making an image from this telescope required that we not only develop new instrumentation, but also design algorithms to process and interpret the collected data to form the image. And this required the expertise of a global team of over 200 collaborators who worked on developing cutting edge instrumentation, data processing, theoretical simulations and analysis. So my primary role in the project has been using techniques from both astronomy and computer science in order to combine information from the telescopes around the world to construct and verify that black hole image. Now, Katie, that's awesome. Thanks for, it's so wonderful to hear that from you directly. Now, I have to say this picture of you has become so famous and I think part of the reason is the obvious sense of delight and that kind of feeling of eureka, you know, that you have in that moment and that every developer knows a little bit. What do you remember about that moment? Yeah, definitely. So this was really an amazing day. It was a hot day in June. The data had just finally been released to us for imaging and our collaboration decided actually to split ourselves into four teams. And by splitting ourselves into teams and having each team independently make an image, we avoided a shared human bias in our results. So anyway, when the data was released to us, some of the members of the team I was on, team one, ran into a small room and we got ready to make an image. So we all had imaging scripts that we had each developed on our computers, and we decided to press go on the, at the same time on all of them. And so it was really amazing seeing the picture just start to appear on our screens. And this picture was taken as that was happening. And I was just flipping between uh, awe, disbelief, excitement, and also just praying it wasn't some sort of cruel joke and it wasn't really fake data. But m most of all, I think we were just so proud of what our collaboration had been able to achieve together. And it was really an amazing day. So Katie, des describe the scene a little more. What is this room that you're in? Were you in Boston, Massachusetts, where this photo was taken? Yeah, this picture was taken uh, in Cambridge, Massachusetts, in the office of the EHT director, Shep Dolman. And this is a building where a number of us actually spend a lot of time working together. But the funny thing about this photo is actually it's impossible to see Andrew, my collaborator. So unlike the M87 black hole image, which was truly a collaborative effort, Andrew can claim sole credit for snapping this picture of me as he sat, ne sat next to me making the, a picture of his own. And similarly, similarly, on the other side of the table were a number of other team members, and many others in rooms around the world were doing the exact same thing. A lot of your other team members, like you mentioned, Andrew, have become kind of famous and celebrated in their own right for their work on this project as well. And in fact, we have another surprise for the audience here today, Katie. Do you want to do the honors? Yeah, 
Sure. So actually, six of my colleagues from the team are there in Berlin at the conference with you all. Come on out. Give them a big round of applause. It is so awesome to have the core team that worked on the software behind this black hole image here today. I can't tell how much we're all nerding out over having you on stage. Uh, why don't we go down the line and have you each introduce yourselves and just say a couple words about what you worked on. So I'm Andrew. I work on imaging, so designing um, sort of software to uh, experiment with, test, and validate new methods for converting the EHT's challenging data into images that we can interpret. I'm Kazu. Um, I'm the primary developer of one of imaging software packages and also developing new imaging te uh, techniques that created the first ever picture of black hole from the calibrated telescope data set. Hi, I'm Sarah. I work on data calibration, primarily on modeling the behavior and sensitivity of all the different telescopes in our network. Hi, I'm CK. I architect the cloud computing infrastructure for the EHT, and I scale our algorithm and develop simulation software. I'm Roman. I'm a core developer of a parameter estimation framework, and I do theoretical modeling to figure out why the image looks the way it does. Uh, I'm Lindy. I'm the primary developer of one of our data pipelines. Uh, so this is a process that takes the large and complex data sets from our experiment and reduces it down to a much smaller and much simpler set of data that can be used to form the image. I kind of want to applaud right now, so let's do it. <laughs> Woo! Now, Sarah, you mentioned that you worked on data calibration. Can you tell us what, what that is? So what we record at the telescopes is actually mostly noise. So the calibration process basically is the process of combining all the data and taking out the very weak signal in the recordings and strengthening the signal, modeling the instrument and atmosphere to be able to average down from petabytes of data to all the very nice megabytes of strong signal data that then get passed down to analysis. That's great. And then, Andrew, you mentioned that you worked on imaging, which I guess is kind of like a next step in the process. Can you tell us about how that works? Yeah, so we don't actually have the resources yet to build a single Earth-sized telescope. So as Katie mentioned, the EHT is a virtual telescope. We need to devise new uh, software and strategies for converting our data into images and inferring what uh, a single telescope would see. Awesome. And then, CK, uh, Katie mentioned, and, and I think you mentioned also, a little bit about the open source components that you used in the project. Can you tell us about your stack? What languages and packages did you use a little bit? Yes, we use many open source libraries. And uh, once the data hit the calibration and imaging step that Sarah and Andrew just, just described, we are mainly on a Python stack. So uh, you know, NumPy, SciPy, SchoPy, and MapPolyp are all very, very important to us. OK, that's awesome. Now, this team is actually going to be here all day. And they're going to give a talk at 5.20 today on this stage, going into a lot more detail about the project and all the details of everything they did. Thank you all very much for being here. And Katie, thank you again for dialing in from Boston. Thanks for having us. This team is just the tip of the iceberg. More than 200 people worked on the Event Horizon Telescope team. And as I mentioned last week to Congress, we're deeply grateful to all the open source contributors who made our work possible as well. Thank you. Let's give these folks a big round of applause. Thank you all very much. Thanks. It's just so cool to have that team here. I've been like fanboying them constantly. So um, now, as both Katie and CK mentioned, the team actually used a lot of Python code. And they made use of a lot of uh, open source Python libraries in the work that they did. And their code is all public. So we can actually go to the repo and look at it. And we can also look at their dependency graph. And here it is. You can see they've got quite a few different dependencies in the graph. And in fact, all together in the complete set of transitive dependencies that made up these Python scripts, there's over 100 different open source Python packages. And some of these are probably used pretty heavily. Some used a little less so. But it's a really interesting list to kind of look through. And as we were scanning through this out of curiosity, we started to wonder, how many people did it take to build all of this, right? 
how many individuals contributed to the full dependency graph that the Event Horizon team used? And so we ran the query. And the number turns out to be more than 21,000 people. It's incredible. 21,000 people around the world were involved in building these scripts. And we have another surprise for you. As it happens, some of those 21,000 people are here in the audience today. And so if you worked on any of these projects, please stand up, turn around, face the rest of the audience. We are so lucky to have with us today maintainers and core contributors to NumPy, Matplotlib, SciPy, AstroPy, Pandas, Python, Dynasty, Cython, KiwiSolver, and many other packages. These people represent the 21,000 who were part of this extended team that made this work possible. We're so proud to have you all here. Thank you each for your contributions to human progress. Let's give them a big hand again. Thanks, everybody. Thank you all. OK, so the image that needed a planet-sized telescope also really did truly require a planet-sized team to build it. And by the way, at least one of the people who's here, when we called them up and invited them to come, did not know that their work had contributed to the black hole image and was very moved by that. And I thought that was really cool. Uh, it's sort of the magic of open source. Now, as Katie said, uh, this is when you look at the team that's working directly on a code base, in a way, you're looking at the tip of the iceberg, right? This isn't just the story of this one software project. This is the story of all software projects today that use open source. So the tip of the iceberg, those direct contributors are the ones who are building your code. But below the waterline are the developers who are contributing to your dependencies. And we've been using the phrase community contributors to refer to these people. They're like the people who are here in the audience today. And one of the things you might be thinking is, well, OK, this Event Horizon team, they wrote their code in Python. They used a lot of high-level astronomy libraries. Maybe they're an outlier, right? Maybe this 21,000 number is atypically high. And we were curious about that, too. So we decided to sample 1,000 of the most popular repos on GitHub, including repos like uh, WordPress and Rails and TensorFlow and others. And we ran the query, and we averaged it all together. And we discovered that, on average, these 1,000 projects had more than 74,000 contributors. Woo! It's amazing. <laughs> this is the actual size of our teams, right? Think about it for a second. This is more software engineers than work at Google or Apple or Microsoft. It's actually more people than there are in the entire employee base of 90% of the Fortune 500. And for a couple of you out there, this is more people than the population of Burning Man. So it's, it's a pretty big group. And it's a testament to how software development works today, right? It takes a community to write code. So to make this interconnected community and the reality of this more concrete for each of us in our everyday work, we're introducing two new features to GitHub today, community contributors and dependent repositories. So today, if you go to a repo, like this is NumPy, you can see that we actually call out how many contributors that repo has today. Well, we're adding a hover card, so when you bring your mouse up, you can see the total number of community contributors. You can see who they are, browse them, and get to know your extended team. It's pretty cool. Then we're adding a new signal for you to understand a repo's popularity. So right now, when you look at a repo, you can see how many forks it has, how many stars it has, how many people are watching it. Uh, today, now, when we're adding used by. So you can see how many other projects on GitHub make use of the dependencies, the packages that are in that repo. We hope this is a useful signal of a repo's popularity that can help you make better choices. And for you as a maintainer, it's pretty cool. You can see how many people are using your stuff. Uh, you can even click on it and see exactly who those users are and which repos you've, you know, that have joined in the last week or so. Uh, we screenshotted NumPy a week ago, and it went up by about 1,000 users in the week. So that was pretty cool. So I'm personally really excited about these two little features. They're rolling out today. Uh, community contributors is 
Python first, and it'll roll out to the other language communities after that. And dependent repositories is available for all the languages supported by the GitHub dependency graph. OK, so at GitHub, our mission is to build the global platform for developer collaboration and to make more stories like the one you heard this morning possible every day. And we're really here to serve you. We're here to serve the developers and the companies who count on GitHub every day. And we've been spending a lot of time in the last six months in conversations with developers, maintainers, and our customers, and using your input to shape our roadmap. And so today, the new features that we're going to show you are based on the things that you've told us that you want. And we're going to start with security. So to tell you more about that, please welcome GitHub Head of Product, Shanku Niyogi. Shanku? Good to see you, Shanku. Thank you, Nat. Good morning, everyone. Wow, that was, that was inspiring, wasn't it? Yeah. Um, it is amazing to think of what the interconnected community can do for software development, right? Like, think about strangers from across the world coming together, collaborating, and building amazing things, and even creating human progress, right? That's so powerful. But with that power, there's also a need for responsibility. We've got to build software that is secure and trustworthy, because um, you know, the strength of this community is built on trust, right? We have to trust each other. And the software that we're building is for a purpose. It's for our users, right? And our users need to be able to trust that software and, and trust us. So the challenge of open source security and trust isn't some abstract thing. It's something that we all need to take a part in. And for sure, there are challenges. Uh, let me tell you a story. This is the story of something called Event Stream. EventStream is a node module. Um, it's used in tens of thousands of projects, uh, including in a lot of enterprises. And EventStream is maintained by one developer, an, an amazing developer who builds a lot of other popular software projects. And one day, he got approached by another developer who offered to make EventStream better. And of course, he accepted that offer, right? It's what you do in this open source community. When people want to help you, you trust them. But this person was a malicious actor. And what they did was they put a vulnerability into EventStream. And they got it published. And they, they did it actually very cleverly. They put it in a dependency and made it very hard to detect. And it took almost a month for that issue to be found. And in that time, the package got downloaded millions of times. This could have been a disaster, except that they decided to do a very specific attack. They didn't attack everyone. They attacked one app that was using EventStream. It was a, a Bitcoin wallet app called Copay. And sure enough, Copay picked up that package. They ended up uh, having to deal with their users and send them warnings. Um, but it could have been a lot worse, right? And these kinds of challenges are going to happen. And, and not just because there are malicious actors out there, but because of us, because we're humans, right? Humans make mistakes. And when those lead to vulnerability issues, we need to deal with them. So we can all use better tools to help us do that. Now at GitHub, we believe that the power of that interconnected community that helps you build software also helps you build more secure software. Uh, if you think about all the people involved in this, right, in keeping stuff secure, you've got researchers who are finding issues, maintainers who are having to go fix them, uh, developers who are having to stay on top of their dependencies and make, pick up those changes, and then security teams who are, who are kind of keeping an eye on it all. We need to help everyone collaborate better so we can be more secure. And I want to share today some of the tools that GitHub is providing to help do that. So let's start with developers and administrators. Now, in November 2017, we released something called Security Vulnerability Alerts for GitHub. Um, with this, GitHub now actually scans all of your dependencies and continuously, compares them against vulnerability data, and sends you an alert whenever you've got a vulnerable dependency. Um, and because we're GitHub, we can do this on a planet scale. So in just the last 12 months, we have actually sent almost 27 million vulnerability alerts to developers. Now, you're probably wondering how many of them actually got addressed. 
we'll talk about that later. Um, <laughs> but if you don't have vulnerability alerts signed up today, um, you can go to GitHub and sign up. But I'm also excited to announce today that we're now generally making available GitHub vulnerability alerts for GitHub Enterprise Server. So with this, even if you're doing local development in ser on your server, you can connect to GitHub, and you can get the same alerts to help keep your code secure. I'm also excited to announce today that we're partnering with WhiteSource. And WhiteSource is an industry leader in vulnerability data. They, they collect vulnerability data from lots of different places. And thanks to WhiteSource, we are now making that vulnerability data available through alerts in GitHub. So we're very excited about that partnership. Now, alerts are great, but what if you want to keep on top of all of your dependencies, right? GitHub Dependency Insights helps you do that. Think of GitHub Dependency Insights as a full overview of all of your dependencies. So you can go and understand each dependency. You can go look at what's changed there, who's working on it. Um, you can get this overview of all of the security state of your dependencies. We're also including license information uh, so that you can actually understand your license compliance state of all your code. So Dependency Insights is kind of an essential tool for developers and security teams and compliance teams to work together to understand the security and compliance state of your software. And it's available today. Now let's go ahead and look at how bugs get found and fixed. Now at GitHub, we've got a dedicated team that works on security issues. It's an amazing team. But if you've got an open source project right, for a maintainer, um, this is a hard problem. right? Because if a security issue comes in from somewhere, all of a sudden, this interconnected community becomes a very dark place. right? You've got to go race against time to go investigate the issue, figure out what happened. You've got to go figure out a patch, get that patch built and tested, get it out there, issue an advisory. And all the time, you're hoping that you don't show up on Hacker News, right? <laughs> right? It's not, not fun. Is it fun? No. Uh, so what you need is better tools to do that. And today, we're announcing a tool, set of tools to help you. So first, how does a security researcher find you? Well, in the industry, there's a convention for this. Every big project has it. It's called a security policy. It, it helps researchers understand how to disclose bugs responsibly to you. Now you can have a security policy, too, because we're building that into GitHub. So with GitHub's security policy, you can now author a security policy for your project, or you can author it for your entire org, and it will automatically cascade down to every repo. And now researchers know how to work with you. That's an important first step. Now, once you've got that, what happens when an issue comes in, right? Like, what you'd like to do is you'd like to go to a nice place with the people you trust uh, in a private environment and be able to investigate that issue. And you can now do that with something called maintainer security advisories. Let's take a look at how it works. So a new issue comes in, and what I can do is go ahead and create something called a draft advisory. This is something new in GitHub that we're announcing today. So once you've done that, what, what you now create is this kind of entire private workspace where you can work on the problem. So you can invite in the people you trust, maybe that security researcher that filed the issue. You can go discuss. You can go investigate in a completely private space. When you're ready, you can create something called a temporary private fork. This is a completely private fork of your code that is available only to the people that you invite. And now you can work with them on a security issue. You can build and test the patch. You'll get a unique Git URL, so you can use it with your Git tools. And when you're ready, you can go ahead and merge that pull request back into your code. We also provide a set of tools to help you author that advisory and submit it to GitHub. And when you do that, we'll take care of the rest for you. We will publish that advisory, and voila, there's a published advisory ready to go. So 
what we're doing with this set of tools is really helping build security best practices in open source. And that's good for everyone, right? So with these tools and working together with our uh, great security vendors such as uh, HackerOne, we want to build these kinds of security best practices directly into GitHub. Now, organizations like the CNCF uh, have a bunch of custom security tools today. And they're going to be switching to using a lot of our GitHub tools, and we're going to be working with them. But you can have these tools too, because our maintainer security tools are going to be available to every single open source project for free. So now let's get to the hard part, doing those patches. Yeah? Now, it turns out the industry data shows that more than 70% of vulnerabilities actually remain unpatched for three months. A lot of them go over a year. And you've probably seen some news stories about this, right? We can do better, right? So we went looking at how people have tried to solve this problem, how people are dealing with it. What we actually found was a number of partners in our ecosystem have tried to already go solve this problem. And one of them is Dependabot. So Dependabot is a product that takes a great approach to trying and addressing this problem of patching vulnerabilities. So to tell us more about it, I'd like to invite the co-founder of Dependabot, Gray Baker, to the stage. Gray? Hi, Gray. Hi, thank you. So, Tell us about how Dependabot came about. What was, what was the problem you were trying to solve? Well, in 2004, I was working at a startup, and one of my jobs was managing our dependencies. We were a payments company, so we really cared about stability. But we also didn't want to end up on outdated or insecure dependencies. We wanted all the great features that maintainers are pushing all the time. And what we decided was that the best approach was to update our dependencies little and often. So we always knew exactly what we were deploying. They were always just small changes. The problem was that that required me to create dozens of pull requests to update our dependencies every single week. And they were beautiful pull requests. I was pulling in the change log, you know, any release notes that were there. But it was tedious manual work creating them. And that's what we built Dependabot to solve. So you built a bot to automate yourself, right? Yeah. <laughs> so, so tell us what happened next. Well, we used the GitHub API to build this bot. And it's basically like having me on your team updating your dependencies for you. So every day, Dependabot checks whether or not you're using the latest version of everything that you depend on. And if you're not, then it opens individual pull requests to update you. I think we've got an example pull request to show. So in that pull request, you can see it's just doing a very small update. It's a patch. And it's pulled in the change log, the release notes, and in this case, because it's fixing a vulnerability, details of the vulnerability that's being fixed. The idea is to make that pull request as easy to merge as possible. So if I make a change, everyone who's using my code now gets a pull request with the change and all the information they need to be able to accept that pull request? Yeah, exactly. So if you're a maintainer and you push a new version, then pretty soon, Dependabot will create pull requests for everybody that's using it to update to that version. And we've had over 500,000 of these pull requests merged just in the last year, um, including by some fantastic customers who have really helped us along the way. We're grateful for all the feedback from folks at Webpack, Mastodon, and many others. Wonderful. Now, there is one pull request that I think you and I are very excited about. Yeah, there is. Shall we show them? I think we should. All right. I am super thrilled to announce that Dependabot is now a part of the GitHub family. Welcome to GitHub, Gray. <laughs> And that's not all, is it? It's not. We couldn't be more excited to be joining GitHub. And we've got a feature to announce for everybody today, which is that we've built automated security fixes. So now, whenever you receive a security alert from GitHub, 
you'll also get a pull request to fix that insecure vulnerability. Awesome. How does one sign up? <laughs> Automated security fixes are available today. You can opt in from the repo settings page on any repo. They support all of the languages that Security Alert supports, and we'll be rolling them out to everybody over the next two months. Wonderful. Thank you, Gray. Thank you, Shanky. So this interconnected community we have, we believe that using that power together with great tools helps us write more secure code, be able to use other people's code with more confidence, and ultimately build applications our users trust. And today, we're giving you a set of tools to do that, and we want to continue to work with you. Thank you. Now we want to share how our interconnected community actually extends into enterprises and large organizations and helps them be part of the community too. And to tell you about that, I'm super excited to have Dana Lawson, Vice President of Engineering, join us. Dana? Danke, Shanku. I've been waiting to say that for a long time. Howdy, y'all. What a privilege it is to be here today in beautiful Berlin. And I don't know about you, but this space is just absolutely mind-blowing. Uh, I've never been at a conference like this. Um, so as you've heard from Nat, Shanku, and Gray, that the world of open source is truly an interconnected community. Not only does it take a global team to create your favorite open source technologies, the same is true for enterprise products and companies that we've come to know, love, and trust. Did you know that enterprise companies are the largest contributors and consumers of open source? And we are so proud to play a part in the products that these software companies make. With over 2 million organizations trusting GitHub, as well as over half of the Fortune 50 companies use GitHub Enterprise for their internal development. I love that these companies are sharing their code and ideas but the downside for these large-scale organizations is that it's just still too difficult to understand how they're using open source, how secure they are, in addition to what packages and products they're bringing into their ecosystems. But more importantly, how their broader teams are innovating and collaborating. Here at GitHub, we listened, and I am so pleased to announce, available today, these four new enterprise features that will help not only me as an engineering leader, but countless other companies as they continue to innovate. And they are enterprise accounts, internal repos, new roles and permissions, and organization insights. So let's dive in. Last October, we introduced a limited beta for enterprise account feature. With enterprise accounts, you can group all the organizations in a single account, making it easier for you to manage the needs of every org and team in your company. But just with enterprise accounts, we also wanted to make it easier for companies to share their code across the organization in a safe, open, and secure way. Before, you only had two choices, private and public repos. And today, we're introducing internal repos. I'm sure you're like, what are internal repos? They don't make no sense. We already have private repos. I know, right? Um, but internal repos are a way for helping enterprise companies stay interconnected because software development is truly a team sport. It takes designers, tech support, sales, even bosses like me, uh, and others in an organization to build these products we love. Because it's not just about developing code. It's about everything that we do to make it wonderful. So now with enterprise internal repos, you can broadly share your projects where every user in an enterprise account can participate. No more trudging through going, hey, can I get access to that? Can I get access to that? Now you have access to that. So you're welcome. <laughs> so we created enterprise accounts. Yeah. It's a big deal, y'all. So we created enterprise accounts to easily manage your org and internal repos to intersource your projects. But we also wanted to help maintainers, because it's not all about enterprise. It's really about y'all. 
And enterprises alike have the ability to give the right access at the right time. Because like I said, it's not just about writing code. It's about everything else that happens. And it's just equally as important. Our goal is to enable everyone to contribute, no matter if you're new to open source or you're an enterprise company with nuanced needs. So we've worked to overhaul our permission model to introduce new roles for your team, the triage and maintain role. The triage role allows users the ability to manage issues without having to have write access to your code. So I know you maintainers are going to feel pretty good about that when those noobs get in your repos and you're like, I don't know you, but I love you, but you can't write. So you're welcome. <laughs> the maintain role, which has most of the rights of admins, but removes the ability to do dangerous things like delete repos. Because believe me, you don't want to do that. Not that I have, but maybe I, OK, I have. But whatever. You don't want to be that person. Don't be me. That's, that's why I don't, you know, anyway. <laughs> now that we have all these tools to better enable your enterprise teams to ship smarter, faster, and more secure, we also wanted to give them the ability to understand how they're using their development work flows. With organization insights, you can now understand where your teams are spending time in these workflows, what languages you're using, and what's changing over time in your company's ecosystem. And this is just the beginning. With org insights, our goal is to be the instrument panel for your development lifecycle. Now listen, I am sure you are as excited as I am about these features. And we are bringing to developers, maintainers, and enterprise companies alike. And I am also sure you never thought enterprise could be so cool, because believe me, it is. I mean, look at this. Um, but most importantly, more, <laughs> most importantly, valuable, because it really does take a global team to build these global products. And we really want to enable everybody, no matter where you come from, no matter where you work, and no matter what you do. But don't just take my word for it. Here to tell their story how enterprise company Shopify has embraced open source and enabled their culture with the mantra, open by default, are Sebastian and Christian. Thank you, Dana. And thank you for having us. This is really exciting. So my name is Christian. I'm a staff developer on the payments team in Montreal. And I'm Sebastian, senior production engineer, also in Montreal. So we're part of Shopify. And for those who don't know Shopify, we're an e-commerce platform that allow for small, medium, and big merchants to sell their products across a plethora of channels. And our core mission is really to make commerce better for everyone, which also involves open source. We're at around 4,000 employees now. We have 800,000 merchants across 175 countries. And we have several um, offices around different cities, including in Berlin. Now, Shopify started in 2006. And if we really want to be that 100-year company, we need to invest in our stack. And a big part of our stack is Rails. Rails being powered by Ruby, we actually contribute to its ecosystem. In fact, Toby, our CEO, used to be a core contributor. Now, we also have a dedicated Rails core team with contributors. And as much as possible, we live on the cutting edge releases of Rails. That allows us to benefit from the latest performance enhancements, features, and bug fixes, many of which we contributed to. It also allows us to reduce the maintenance cost, but most importantly, fosters success for all of the community. Thanks. Well, I mean, as much as Rails development is at the core of our business, Shopify platform is actually a full ecosystem of different technologies. I mean, as the company grew, our needs became more specific. And we needed projects that would properly tailor to our specific needs. And after all, writing code is part of the fun of solving problems. Excluding forks, Shopify has over 200 open source repos that are available out there. And perhaps the most interesting story of an open source is Bootsnap. So, Bootsnap is a library that plugs into Ruby and optimizes and caches expensive computations with a focus on reducing the boot time for Rails. For the Shopify core platform, it was able to slash the boot time in four, dropping from 25 seconds to around six. I mean, open source two years ago, the project has received over 100 pull requests, and now it's activated by default in Rails 5.2, powering all the million or so Rails websites out there. I mean, Shopify believes in open doesn't start at the publication of a project, 
but that it's much bigger than open source. Internally, we have a deep culture of a transparency. The vast majority of our Slack communications are happening in public channels. And in the vaults, our internal wiki, we're able to facilitate the search across all of our shared knowledge. I mean, internal work is not about signing NDAs. It's about people working together. But what about the code? I mean, yes, we use GitHub. And with very few exceptions, all developers, designers, content creators have access to all the repositories, issues, and project briefs. Teams are encouraged to create repos and share between each other. GitHub essentially allows us to bring that open source mentality inside Shopify with zero effort. And projects are generally started by individual team. And over time, internal communities will start forming and, um, around technologies and sharing their struggles and their solutions. I mean, organically, projects become co-maintained, and they spread throughout the company, eventually becoming the standard and re recommended by default on our projects. If and when those projects be are made public, those same communities carry on and become the stewards that are public facing. GitHub can help us carry off the open philosophy throughout that development cycle. But allowing the communities to flourish that much tends to multiply the number of repositories. Throughout its years, Shopify has created over thousands of repositories. And having so many repos comes with com some complexity. The role of my team, developer acceleration, is to reduce that friction, to automate and to standardize. I mean, our customers are the developers. We want to empower them. And the better we enable them, the better they go on and serve their own customers. So we integrate into GitHub's API. And we provide tooling for local development, review, testing, production. And even after production, carries on in the maintenance and the feedback loop that comes back. Whether development is happening within a team, across team, or out in the public, the platform remains the same. That's a lot of investment. But connecting our teams with the rest of the world, we allow the crowdsourcing of that maintenance and the rest of the development. So we've been doing open source for many years. And I wish we had developer acceleration a decade ago. So about around 2008, 2012, um, we released two open source libraries under a sister GitHub organization called Active Merchants. And the goal of those libraries were a means of quickly expanding the payments accepted by merchants in new markets. And at the time, it was the easiest way we knew of for expansion. So let me explain a bit. The way it would work is partners would write their own implementation of those libraries. Those libraries would have just simple abstractions. They'd open up a PR, we'd review it, then merge it back, and that would save us from writing all the code. Then we'd simply bump the version of Active Merchant inside of our platform, and merchants would instantly have access to many more payment gateways. So in that sense, we ended up in a very interesting client-provider relationship. We not only provided the platform, but we provided an SDK to work with the platform. And this beneficial two-way street of collaboration allowed growth not only for Shopify, but for payment gateways to be included on Shopify. And then being that it's open source, it doesn't stop there, right? We also have a co-maintainer, Spreadly, who uses the libraries in production as well. And this is only one example of ours. So investing in open source means different things, obviously different things for different companies at different stages. But if done correctly, applying the open principles to various communities, be it internal or external, blurs the lines and makes them interconnected. Having an open mindset is beneficial to everyone. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Sebastian, Christian. Thank you, Dana, Shanku, and Gray. We're so excited to have the Shopify team here and to hear from them that it really is possible. You really can build a team on this open by default type of practice. So we're really excited in that. Now, we're coming to the last section, and I'm super excited to talk to you about what's next. 
This year, we've had hundreds of conversations with maintainers and open source contributors. And I actually have a practice that I'm really loving right now, which is I personally spend a couple of hours every Friday having video calls with maintainers of big open source projects and small open source projects. Some of you I've talked to on Fridays before. It's become one of the favorite parts of my week for me. And it's also been, in combination with everything else we're doing, a really great way for us to learn from you about the challenges and the opportunities that you have in the open source world and how GitHub can serve you better. And so we have some pretty exciting news to unveil today. And to tell you more, please welcome Devin Zugel. Devin? Thanks. Thanks, Nat. Hi, I'm Devin, and I'm the product manager of the open source economy team here at GitHub. Our work is focused on maintainers and building tools for the open source community to thrive. As Nat showed earlier, we're all connected. The world runs on open source. None of it would be possible without the global team of maintainers, developers, designers, researchers, writers, and more who devote their time to pushing technology forward. Like the scientists on stage earlier today, each of us builds on the work of others. And each of the developers we depend on has a story. Let me introduce you to a few open source maintainers who've built software that you've likely used yourself. Meet Mariata. She's a Python core developer from Vancouver and she has a ritual of taking an ice cream selfie after each conference talk she gives. <laughs> and here's Fatih. He's from Ankara, Turkey, and he's the creator of Vim Go. Fatih works from home, so when he needs a break, he gets to play with his adorable son, Alper. And meet Henry, who's based in New York City and left his job last year to work on open source full time. Henry is the maintainer of Babel, which is an NPM package that we use here at GitHub. It's these developers that make the GitHub community what it is. The strength of this connected community depends on the continued success of developers, just like Mariata, Fatih, and Henry. And at GitHub, this is the core of what we're about. We're here to support the humans behind human progress. In that spirit, we're thrilled to announce a brand new feature of GitHub. I'm so excited to share that today we're launching the beta of GitHub Sponsors, a new way to financially support the developers you depend on. I'm really excited too. <laughs> Uh, this is a first step. The, the purpose of this beta is to get your feedback, and we're really excited to hear from you. So I bet you're just as excited as I am. So let's see how it works. To start, let's sponsor Mariata. We'll head to her GitHub profile, and you'll see there's a new sponsor button right on her profile. I'm a huge space nerd, so I think it's awesome that her contributions to Python played a role in creating the black hole image. When I see that button, I'm super excited that I can now show her my support. Clicking it takes me to her sponsorship page. Here, she gets to decide how to represent herself and how you can best support her. Now let's see this from Mariotta's perspective. When she goes to my profile, or when she sees my profile hover card, she will see a new call out that says your sponsor, so she knows I'm invested in her work. We've also built this into existing GitHub workflows so that it's seamless to support developers. I'm really excited about this because it'll surface developers that you can sponsor directly from the conversations where you collaborate with them. For instance, perhaps Fatih has been really helpful as I make my contributions to Vim Vimgo. Imagine I've merged my first PR into the project and I want to thank him for all his help. I can jump straight into the sponsorship page from the hover card on the PR. But maybe you want to support a project, not a person. To do that, we've also added support for a new file called funding.yaml that makes it easy to support the project however the maintainers see fit. When funding.yaml is added to a project's master branch, a new sponsor button will appear at the top of the repo. 
clicking the button opens a natively rendered view of the funding links listed in that file. It can showcase the, sponsor, the GitHub sponsors profiles of the developers who contribute to the project, or it can also link to other popular funding models, including Open Collective, Community Bridge, Tidelift, and more. Open source is the heart of GitHub. The developers who build our shared digital infrastructure are what make this community so strong. As a thank you for these valuable contributions, GitHub sponsors charges zero platform fees when you support the work of other developers. We'll also cover payment processing costs for the first 12 months of the program to celebrate the launch. 100% of your sponsorship goes directly to the developer. GitHub Sponsors also supports payouts in all around the world in every country where GitHub does business. Over the course of the summer, we're excited to be working with Stripe to scale up this beta. We're all part of a global software team. Expanding opportunities to participate on that team is at the core of our mission, so we are proud to make this tool available to developers worldwide. Finally, many contributions that are crucial to a well-functioning project don't show up in code review. GitHub Sponsors is built for funding all types of work that advance open source software. Anyone who contributes to open source, whether through code, documentation, leadership, mentorship, design, technical writing, I could spend the rest of this keynote listing things that go into an open source project, all of those people are eligible for sponsorship. GitHub Sponsors is one more way to contribute to open source, financially supporting the people who build and maintain it. Starting today, any GitHub user can sponsor an open source developer in the beta. If you're interested in getting sponsored for your own work, you can apply at github.com slash sponsors. We're launching small and simple, but our mission is vast, to expand opportunities to participate in and build on open source. We're here to serve the developer community, and we're eagerly listening for your input for what you'd like to see in GitHub sponsors. We're really excited to hear from you. Thanks, and back to you, Nat. Great job. There you go. That was awesome. All right. Thank you, Devin. We are so excited about the launch of GitHub sponsors and this new mechanism for supporting independent developers directly on GitHub. And we're equally excited to hear your feedback and learn how we can improve this program. So please let us know what you think. Now, Devin mentioned that one of the great features of GitHub sponsors is that we cover all of your payment processing fees for the first year and that there are no platform fees, so that 100% of your contribution goes directly to the developer that you sponsor. And 100% is amazing, but we were thinking about it, and we realized that what's better than 100% is 200%. So with today's announcement, we've also created the GitHub Sponsors Matching Fund, where we will double your contribution to developers for the first year. This enables us to really jumpstart the GitHub Sponsors program and boost the contributions that you make while still giving you the empowerment and the freedom to choose who in the open source community you want to support. So we're really excited about this. OK, we covered a lot of ground today, so let's just step back and do a brief recap. Shanku talked to you about some of the new security features that we've released, including maintainer security advisories, security policies, and together with Gray, the acquisition of Dependabot, which we're really excited about. We've been saying internally that Dependabot is a little bit like a Roomba for your code. It just <laughs> kind of comes out and cleans it up for you. And then Dana showed you some new capabilities for enterprises, from enterprise accounts to internal repos to new roles, the triage and maintain role, which will be really useful for open source communities as well, and permissions and the organizational insights. And then we heard from Christian and Sebastian at Shopify about the best practices that they're using. And then Devin showed you GitHub sponsors, and we talked about the sponsors matching fund. Additionally, just two weeks ago, we announced the GitHub package registry which gives you a single place to store your code and your packages behind a single 
log in. And then coming up later this summer, we will have some more news to share about GitHub Actions. As I mentioned before at GitHub, our mission is to build the global platform for developer collaboration. And that really means that our job is to serve you, right? To make your life easier, to make you more productive, to help you connect to the developers and contributors who make your work possible. So thank you for joining us this morning. We hope you enjoy the rest of the conference. Thanks so much.